Good afternoon and good evening to those of you uh, on the East Coast. Welcome to the sixth annual Turo University California Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series hosted by the Public Health Program. My name is Gail Cummings and I am the Program Director for the Public Health Program at Turo University California. I will be moderating today's final session of our six part speaker series along with Professor Deirdre Wilson. This year's series titled Public Health in Times of Conflicts has taken us on a deep dive COVID-19 and the impact of police violence, both of which have collided into a devastating pandemic tandem and both of which have disproportionately impacted black, indigenous and other people of color. Our speakers this year have really helped us to understand and untangle the root causes, implications, the intersections and solutions of these two public health crises. And today's presentation uh, by Dr. D David Anzel takes us one step closer to drawing out an analysis, which we think is intended to help us not just react, but to take action and to really move us closer to a more just, equitable and humane society. Before I turn it over to Professor Wilson, I'd like to remind us all that November is American Indian and Alaskan Native Heritage Month, which again, just provides us one more opportunity to remember, to focus and to learn about diverse cultures, traditions, and the important contributions and histories of our indigenous Americans. Because this was generally not a part of our traditional education for most of us, um, it, it is really incumbent incumbent upon us to seek these truths as a means of understanding the rich and painful history of our country and to work collaboratively to repair and heal these wounds that can truly uplift uh, society as a whole. So before we be begin today's session, I would like to proceed with a land acknowledgement statement. Even though we continue to meet virtually, we still think it's important because it recognizes that the land itself is not just a space that bodies occupy in all of us, no matter where we are currently sitting, standing, we all reside on what is indigenous territory. It is also uh, allows for an expression of gratitude and appreciation, as well as a way to honor and understand the history of specific tribal nations. Our statement is as follows. We want to acknowledge that Turo University, California, located on Mare Island, is a site on the traditional land of the coastal Miwoks, the Sassoons, and the Patuan peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout generations. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Deirdre Wilson, Chair of the Community Action for Health Concentration. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today we have, as Professor Cumming said, our last and uh, six, uh, last in the six series session. And we'll wrap up with Dr. David Ansel. This evening, this evening we are also offering continuing medical education units. I will place this information in the chat for those who are interested. It is important that you log on to the Continuing Medical Education Unit site and enter the code while the session is going on. So in between the hours of four and six, make sure you log on and tomorrow the link will be expired. Sorry for that. Uh, for the purposes of today, we will be recording the session. Um, and this serves as a reminder that the session will be recorded. I'd, la I'd now like to introduce Dr. David Ansel. Dr. Ansel is the Michael E. Kelly Presidential Professor of Internal Medicine and Senior Vice President Associate Provost for Community Health Equity at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He is a 1978 graduate of SUNY Upstate Medical College. 
He did his medical training at Cook County Hospital in Chicago and spent 13 years at Cook County as an attending physician and ultimately was appointed chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine at Cook County. From 1995 to 2005, he was chairman of internal medicine at Mount Sinai, Chicago. He was recruited to Rush University Medical Center as an inaugural chief medical officer in 2005, a position he held until 2015. His research and advocacy has been focused on eliminating health inequities. In 2011, he published a memoir of his times at County Hospital, County Life, Death, and Politics at Chicago's Public Hospital. His latest book, which you're all familiar with, The Death Gap, How an Inequality Kills, was published in 2017. It is our honor to have invited uh, Dr. Ansel to speak to our students and to our uh, community about his experiences, not only in Chicago, but how these experiences are related to what we're experiencing now in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. You'll have to un unmute yourself, Dr. Ansel. Oh my gosh, I just did a br brilliant soliloquy and nobody heard it. Thank you. Well, first, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for all of you who come today to sit around in the Zoom, Zoom uh, theater here uh, to have a discussion uh, of this work. Uh, and I just want to uh, pay homage uh, here where I sit, which is the land of the Potawatomi, the Sauka. Chicago has always been a transit zone uh, Native Americans uh, who lived here uh, showed uh, white, uh, uh, white folks and others who explored this country that this was a great place to come and uh, transit. Uh, and of course, uh, ultimately, the Native Americans were forced off of their land. So I do want to pay homage uh, to the Midwest uh, and, and where we sit right now, where I sit right now. And I want to thank again everyone uh, here for inviting me. And uh, I want to try to play uh, as I start with a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an internal medicine doctor. I practice still. Uh, I was in the office uh, this week. Uh, the death gap, which you wrote, which you read, uh, some of you, thank you, uh, was a angry reaction I had for this experience of being in Chicago along one street and I call it one street, two worlds of health and healthcare. But everything that I've learned uh, that I'm gonna talk to you about today, I never learned in professional school. I learned through listening to my patients, the stories of their lives and the observations I made. And that uh, took me to move into a new realm uh, of my career, which uh, we'll talk about as like, how do we actually not just say what's going on, but how do we change it? So with that, I'm going to get started. Um, it's been a lot of death this year. A lot of death. I was at the cemetery four times in a week. Gone, gone. That's been like a nightmare barrage. Let's pray, God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, your loving kindness. When COVID nineteen began spreading day. across the U.S., Doctor Ansel, you're not sharing your screen yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. How did that happen? I thought I was showing you this wonderful video, but apparently, it didn't. Uh, it didn't come up, but let me let me just start uh, here. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, it's there now. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, my talk today is called "The Death Gap: Health Inequity in the Wake of COVID-19," and it's going to be uh, the first uh, 
part of it will tell the story and the second part will be talking about solutions. So this uh, is a view of Chicago. Most of the time, if you see Chicago, you see it from the lake uh, forward uh, uh, and you see the loop, but this is a picture of Chicago drawn by residents of the West Side uh, communities uh, that we serve. There are 600,000 people who live in the West Side of Chicago. Uh, each one of these have neighborhoods have different names, uh, different uh, set of pride around each of these neighborhoods, lots of assets. When you hear Chicago, uh, oftentimes people think of uh, uh, you know bad things. Uh, West Side of Chicago, uh, it's not uh, known for its verdant greenery and assets, but along here, you can see the uh, life expectancies of, uh, uh, of the neighborhood. So for people who live in the neighborhoods, their sense of their community is very different uh, than for most people who view Chicago and see the, the very nice downtown. Uh, I'm gonna talk in three parts today, and I do that just in case you're getting tired of one part, another one's going to come up. Uh, I'm gonna talk about health care's uh, historic harms and COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter and how these, uh, uh, the history of health harm caused by healthcare in America, uh, how that connects into the narrative of COVID and Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the work uh, that we've done in Chicago to take this idea of health equity or justice, uh, the idea that those who need more should get more uh, and make that not just a program of a, of a health science university uh, academic medical system, but as a strategy. And then I'm gonna talk about some innovations that we've uh, had in Chicago, uh, something called Westside United and something that has uh, arisen out of uh, the COVID pandemic, which is the Chicago Racial Equity Rapid Response Team. So you would have to be blind uh, to uh, not acknowledge that we're a nation that's very divided. Uh, in these four pictures, it kind of tell the story uh, of this year uh, in, in American, uh, in American uh, history. So on the upper left uh, is the disproportionate, uh, uh, disproportionality of COVID-19. Uh, and this disproportionality uh, uh, was, was quite striking, uh, not just in Chicago, but all across the country. Uh, in Chicago, 45% of the deaths are in Black people. 45% of the cases are in Latinx people. And both of those groups make about a third of the population. Of the first 100 deaths in Chicago, 70 were in Black people. Uh, so I'll get to more of that. Uh, uh, Kitty Corner, bottom right, Black Lives Matter movement. We all watched uh, uh, in shock, uh, in shame, uh, at the uh, murder, the lynching of George Floyd, uh, a helpless man, uh, his uh, capture uh, 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 on his neck while uh, Mr. Floyd narrated his own murder. Uh, the shocking, uh, nature of that uh, uh, arose I, I, a, a multiracial movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, that we haven't seen in many years. The idea that systemic racism, police brutality uh, at the time of COVID, by the way, police murders of Black uh, people did not decrease despite the COVID lockdowns. They were uh, at the exact same rate that they've been going on uh, in prior years. Uh, bottom left, uh, this is uh, last week in Washington, D.C., uh, Trump, uh, the Trump nation, uh, largely uh, 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 white, uh, but not exclusively, but largely white. Uh, and uh, we've seen the rise of white supremacism, uh, anti-Semitism, and uh, anti-Islamophobia, uh, uh, and you name it, uh, in a way that we haven't seen in this country since the 1930s. Uh, the number one uh, terrorist risk in this country 
is from white extremists, uh, given cover, uh, fuel, oxygen by the very president of the United States uh, and many, many other supporters. And in the upper right-hand corner, uh, this is from last week at all, this is in Dallas, Texas. This is a line of cars waiting for food. The economic dislocation, uh, 20 million unemployed, uh, uh, the highest number of out of work people since the Great Depression. So we are in a pandemic, uh, but the pandemic is more than the virus. It's a pandemic of, uh, the pandemic of racism uh, in which the virus just planted uh, its seeds, uh, the, uh, a, a pandemic of truth denial. Uh, so what I'm gonna to talk to you today is what I learned uh, almost the first day in medical school. When I went into medicine, I went to medicine because I wanted to take care of people. Uh, and that ultimately uh, led me to want to take uh, care of those who've been marginalized. I thought that that would be enough, but it turns out as a doctor, and I hope you as healthcare uh, students and professionals who are listening today, you will understand that it is our obligation uh, to, bo uh, to be uh, political because just as they, we we're gonna talk about social and structural determinants of health, there are political determinants of health. Uh, so I hope at the end, that by the end of this talk, you will feel uh, um, energized, inspired, um, activated to know that you can be a fantastic suburb professional on your clinical skills, but also uh, be uh, engaged in political life uh, in this country uh, because it's a matter of life uh, of life and death. One of the, uh, I've done this work for a long time. Uh, and when I first started doing it, uh, you know, I was scared. Uh, I was scared uh, to speak. I didn't quite know how to speak about things. I, but I really like everything else we do in time uh, we have to practice it critically to uh, this work is this idea of changing the narrative uh, of, of what's right, of what's wrong. Um, I have a formula that I use for to make change. Narrative plus data plus action equals change. Uh, without the Black Lives Matter movement, we can't really take on uh, anti-racism uh, work uh, without talking about the individual cases of people and families who've suffered from COVID. Uh, uh, we, the statistics will be that one out of every 500 black people in the United States will have uh, death from COVID in their family. Uh, and that's a, 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 a frightening uh, number. We've got to bring these cases alive but it's the narrative plus the data plus the action that equals the change. So I wanna take you back and just tell the story of, uh, of medicine and healthcare in America. And you've probably heard these in, in, in prior talks. I know Dr. Susan Rogers, my colleague from Chicago, she and I did residency together at Cook County Hospital, uh, but I'm sure she spoke to you about this as well. But racism is America's healthcare legacy that our whole system uh, in this country was built on a premise and it was tied to our economic system and tied to the legacy of slavery. The only way you can enslave people is to, is to make them not be human. Uh, and by turning them into subhumans or non-humans, uh, we had to develop a scientific basis for this. And that's exactly what happened. And healthcare in this country uh, has, uh, uh, was segregated from the beginning. It was separate and it was not equal. And I will, I will posit to you uh, in this talk, it still isn't. And there's uh, uh, legacies of scientific racism uh, in America, uh, in American healthcare today. Uh, calculators on kidney function, calculators on heart risk, calculators on breast cancer that still use race as the variable. Uh, and it's based on this idea of eugenics, 
uh, that white uh, skinned people are superior than uh, dark skinned people. Segregation was the standard of care. Uh, in fact, it was the standard of care until 1965 when Medicare uh, was passed. Uh, it turns out that the AMA uh, would not allow black physicians uh, uh, to um, join the AMA. And because they couldn't join the AMA, they couldn't join their local medical societies. And because they couldn't join their local medical societies, they could not get on the medical staff of the hospitals anywhere in the United States. And it wasn't until 1968 that the first black doctors were al allowed in the American Medical Association. This is a poster from World War II. Uh, the blood supply in this country was even segregated. Uh, you don't think about things like that. That white people who needed blood got white blood and black people who needed blood, if there was blood, got black blood. Uh, Charles Drew, who was a uh, famous African-American physician and blood banker, was in a car accident, was taken to a hospital, and apparently they didn't have the right blood. And so uh, I, I believe he died uh, as a result of that car accident, not being cared for uh, in, uh, in a White House because he was black. And this says if it's all the same, it's all the same to him and to science too. Science is proven in chemical, physical, and microscopic tests, that white and Negro blood is identical. Now you think that we live in an era of fake news. Imagine what it took to maintain the lie of biological differences between black and white people, a lie that's being promulgated even to this day, uh, to the det detriment of all of us. Um, so that was then, this is now. In the year, these are two uh, national publications. Unequal Treatment was published in the early 2000s, 20 years ago, by what's uh, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Science. And it outlined for uh, almost every condition measured that black people and white people got different treatment, that actually treatment uh, uh, for uh, black people was different than uh, treatment for white people. Documented 20 years ago, a call to action uh, for which we've never really accomplished the goals. Around the same time, year 2000, uh, came a report, and they've been having these reports every decade, Healthy People 2010. And the goal of Healthy People 2010 was the acknowledgement that if we were going to achieve the health goals of the United States, we had to address the gaps between uh, ethnic uh, uh, black and brown people uh, in this uh, country compared to white people. And the national goal in 2000 was to eliminate health disparities. And yet here we are 20 years later and we're not going to, we're not even close to it. I wanna just make this uh, uh, other point here um, as we move into this, this next piece about the imbalance of our world. I posit that the lack of federal action uh, on uh, COVID and uh, the lack of a coordinated response. And the, one of the reasons why the pandemic is uh, so out of control in this country is because it's disproportionately hitting black and brown people. And because we live in a racialized society in which our, all, all of our decisions are looked at uh, consciously or unconsciously through a racialized lens, uh, because of the lower value we've historically put on black and brown lives, we've allowed this pandemic to get completely out of control. And so what I've described to you is a, a system that's completely out of balance. Uh, if you think about it too, even a little more deeply, um, many hospitals lost money 
uh, during the pandemic. And the reason they did is the way that you make money in this country in healthcare, which is a for-profit healthcare system, is through elective surgery, not taking care of sick people. So many hospitals that had critical care capabilities refused to take transfers from safety net hospitals, oftentimes serving black and brown poor people. Uh, and therefore those, the death rates were higher uh, in those underserved facilities. I'm gonna get into this a little bit uh, uh, and because uh, the hospitals are all, while people are opening their doors trying to care for sick people, uh, the impact on the financial bottom line has driven again decisions that can be viewed as racialized uh, in nature. So I'm going to tell you about sort of changing the narrative a little bit and how do we go about changing the narrative and beginning to think about framing uh, this in a different way. Um, and I'm going to have more to say about uh, sort of how our healthcare system is organized uh, and, and funded uh, in a little bit. I, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my personal story. My parents uh, were immigrants to this country. Uh, they came from England. Their, their parents happened to be living in England. But during World War II, both my mother and father's family on mainland Europe were wiped out in the Holocaust. Um, victims of racism, mass incarceration, and genocide. And I say this to you, uh, not to, to get any sympathy, but that's my family background. We got a picture, my mother died two years ago and a couple of weeks before she died, we got a picture from the files of a Nazi soldier that showed my great, uh, great grandfather being posed uh, in front of uh, uh, gravestones uh, in his hometown. Uh, his name was written in very neat pencil on the back of the uh, photo and his heirs found uh, the genealogist looking at this town. The, the next year he was shot uh, by the Nazis on a forced march. Uh, and uh, his legacy uh, you know, is part of why my family, I happen to be in the United States. Um, when you, uh, what, what the Nazis did was borrow from uh, Jim Crow and they took, uh, they came to the United States they learned what Jim Crow and what we had done with slavery and what we had done with eugenics and actually applied it uh, in, uh, in Nazi Germany um, uh, and Europe. So that gave me an always a sense of needing to um, think beyond the usual solutions. So after um, being uh, almost 30 years in the safety net and coming to Rush, it was really clear to me that a big academic medical center like Rush had no idea what was going on in the community. And while we provided like the best care, we were ranked number one in quality in the nation where US News and World Report honors hospital, we didn't have any idea about the neighborhoods and the conditions right outside our neighborhood. So I moved uh, from being chief medical officer about five years ago into a new role. And it happened when we changed our mission from being the best in healthcare to improving health. And that's an important difference. We were, we had the best box, arguably in healthcare, maybe in the country, certainly in Chicago, but this very different than improving healthcare. And I went to our board of directors and this is a story I told them. We did a community health needs assessment and I brought this map to them. And I said, if you live in the loop, you can live to be 85. And if uh, the loop were a country, it'd be ranked first in the world in life expectancy. Think about, think Spain or Mon Monaco. By the way, the loop is a neighborhood of concentrated white affluence. But you go down the blue line, uh, seven stops, and you get to East Garfield Park and the life expectancy in East Garfield Park plummets to under 69 years. Uh, and that was the life expectancy in the United States in 1950. So you go seven stops down the blue line and you lose seven decades of life expectancy. 
uh, Garfield Park is a neighborhood of concentrated disadvantage, largely black neighborhood. Now, just for all of you in healthcare, this made me have to think about how we spend our time. If everyone in America who needed it got medication to lower their LDL cholesterol, by the way, the, LD, the person who discovered the LDL receptor won the Nobel Prize in medicine and statins, which are used quite commonly to lower uh, cholesterol, bind beautifully to that receptor. You can't almost have a more precision drug uh, than a statin. Uh, but if everyone who got a statin in the United States who needed it, uh, took it, the life expectancy improvement would be 20, uh, would be uh, uh, about 20 minutes. But imagine what you could do if you could change the conditions between the loop in Chicago and the West Side, you could gain 16 years of life expectancy. Here's another way to think about it. <clears throat> A 16 year old young black man who lives in Garfield Park has a little bit more than a 50-50 chance of living to the age of 65. Now, I want of you to all put on your thinking hats uh, and start thinking of causes of death. What's the reason? What's the uh, cause of death that makes the, uh, this true, that a 16-year-old teenager in Garfield Park has a little more than a 50-50 chance of living to the age of 65? A lot of people when thinking through this will say violence is the, uh, is the cause. And certainly gun violence is a problem uh, in neighborhoods like the west side of Chicago. Uh, so I, I don't wanna minimize that. Yet more than 50% of the premature mortality is from cardiometabolic disease, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. And so I say yes, it's a form of violence, but it's structural violence. And it's structural because it's built in to our laws, our policies, our procedures, uh, our, our historic norms, the way we do things, uh, our behaviors. And it's violent because people die early as a result. Uh, and structural racism, which you probably all heard about, is a form of structural violence. Uh, and it's really important uh, to, uh, to speak to this uh, because we can begin to deconstruct, retell a narrative, which I just did. I remember I said narrative plus data plus action equals change. I gave you narrative and then I gave you some data. And everyone's narrative goes to our minds unconsciously see a young black man and we think violence. Uh, but it's important for us to broaden our horizon. You're gonna see in a little bit that on the west side of Chicago and largely across the United States, uh, there are five major uh, conditions that cause premature mortality and almost in every community in America, heart disease and cancer are number one and two. And I'll talk to you a little later about three, four and five, but uh, narrative plus data plus action equals change. We, this is the conversation I had with our board uh, which is largely uh, uh, white men uh, in Chicago. Now, I want to put you back to 20, uh, uh, to this time period. Laquan McDonald in Chicago, 16 year old teenager, this young man's age, was shot by the police 18 times while walking down the street. Poor kid, mentally ill, uh, not given a chance. Uh, and uh, that was the background in which we had this presentation to our board. There had been shootings in Charleston. Uh, there have been a lot of these things, and uh, uh, we had a, uh, a, a national uh, situation in which we felt like locally we had to try to take charge. So I want to show you structural violence in a graph. It's a little bit complicated graph, but this graph uh, says a, a thousand words, and you when we get down to what are the underpinnings of low life expectancy uh, anywhere in this country, this graph is a, a, a way to think about it. This is Chicago. So look at this right-hand side of this graph here. Uh, this is the north side at the top, the south side at the bottom. The blue 
are the areas of the city between 1970 and 2010 that saw an increase in individual income. So if you blue area here saw an increase between 20 and 254% of income relative to 1970 income. So what you can say that these neighborhoods are uh, uh, neighborhoods of concentrated uh, advantage. They've improved since 1970. Uh, these uh, areas in brown, the west in the southwest in the south side of the city, black and brown neighborhoods during that same period between uh, saw a decrease in income between 20 and 114%. The blue area, 21% of the city. The red area, 53% of the city. So when we try to understand why health is poor, why people die prematurely, you have to look at the facts and the data and say what happened. So uh, when we talk about uh, the social determinants of health, as people talk about, there are structural determinants of health. So I talked to you before about the importance of thinking about political determinants of health. These are the economic determinants of health. So people think, oh, these were areas that were disinvested. Uh, actually, what happened is billions of dollars of capital was removed from these neighborhoods. And I just want to talk a little bit about what did that mean uh, uh, to these neighborhoods. Well, one is the people in these neighborhoods, these were factories that moved out. First, they moved to the suburbs, then they moved to the south, then the west, and then they moved offshore. So the decapitalization of the industrial core of cities in Chicago it's nothing new, but I wanna talk about the consequences of that. People lost their insurance. They would show up to hospital. First of all, all the white people left. So you had white flight. It was enabled by uh, public dollars that funded white people to get houses uh, through FHA mortgages, it funded highways that have took uh, people to suburbs. White people, when they got to the suburbs, created enclaves of concentrated white affluence they zoned out lower income housing. So black and brown people could not move largely into these neighborhoods. And then what happened is all the uh, factory owners and the business owners, they all left too and they pulled their businesses out. So when you think of uh, this uh, economic dislocation that occurred and then what happened in these communities, suddenly people were uninsured, they show up to a hospital, that hospital only saw black and brown people now because the neighborhood, uh, the white people would no longer come back to those hospitals. Uh, and those hospitals strained under that uh, weight and these hospitals closed. Uh, the hospitals that stay open right now are decapitalized. They're undercapitalized. So when COVID hit, they didn't have the staff, they didn't have the equipment. So there's, there's an idea here of something called racial capitalism. Uh, and, and what that means is because we devalue people uh, in this country based on skin color, uh, the assets that are available to them are devalued uh, as well. I told in the book, The Death Gap, about being at Sinai. Now, if someone's car broke down uh, in front of Sinai, if they had a car accident, a white person's car uh, had an accident right on Mount Sinai, that's the only way largely that a white person would end up in that hospital. Uh, otherwise, it largely serves black and brown people. It doesn't have capital. When I worked there with my patients, things were just out of reach. Um, the other uh, way to look at this, this is an act of structural and economic violence against a large part of the city. Uh, that this was, this was an act. Uh, the consequence of this act is people lost their insurance. Their health got poor. There were no grocery stores. There were deserts. There is a, is a historical and ongoing act. Uh, uh, it's more devastating even than the pandemic. All the pandemic did was seed itself into the social fault lines that concentrated affluence in neighborhoods that were largely white uh, and, uh, and removed capital from neighborhoods that were uh, largely uh, black. Now it's not quite as simple as all that, but it's largely, this is the story of America. There's two Americas, uh, at least, uh, 
uh, and uh, there's a different, uh, white people's experience in America is different. And I wanna say one other thing about this. 30% of Chicago, 30% of black people in Chicago live in poverty. 10% of white people live in poverty, but there's not one poor white neighborhood. And what this means that if you're a poor white child, you're living in a neighborhood that's surrounded by affluence. So there's a chance that you will do better when you're an adult, not a lot better, by the way, but you'll generally do a little bit better than your parents. Uh, uh, even if your parents are poor, uh, there's really not upward mobility in this country. This is not a meritocracy. It's not lift yourself up by your bootstraps, America. But I wanna go for the black child, a black child uh, living in concentrated poverty is living in a neighborhood of deep poverty. So the black poor child is unlikely to live in a neighborhood of concentrated affluence. Uh, she has very little chance to have those kinds of touches. She, and she goes over to the next neighborhood over and it's as poor. So she's surrounded by concentrated poverty. And the data show that the child who grows up in a black neighborhood poor will make less in general in Chicago than their parents did poor. So this is an act of how structural violence works. There are economic determinants of health. And the impact of this, and it doesn't matter where you are. So we've seen this in white areas of the United States as well. In the last few years, white life expectancy for non-college educated whites, think sometimes this, uh, this is part of Trump's space, has dropped. Uh, lowering life expectancy in the United States for three out of the last four years. It's going to go down this year as well. No other developed country in the United States has seen life expectancy drop. So we're the most developed nation. Uh, we're the richest nation. We have more money in healthcare. And this tells the story here. Uh, this is on the uh, uh, two uh, bar graphs, turn 50 in 1980 on the left, turn 50 in 2010. So here's the life expectancy if you turn 50, uh, look at 1980, uh, there was not a whole lot, about a four year gap. Uh, these bars here are quintiles of income where green is the lowest income quintile and red is the richest quintile. There was about a four year gap between the poorest and the richest quintile uh, if you turn 50 in 1980. But if you turn 50 in 2010, the life expectancy in the lowest quintile of the population has dropped and in the second quintile has dropped while it's risen only in the richest. Uh, this is not true in Canada. This is why Medicare for all, single payer healthcare, why I'm an advocate for it, uh, because uh, uh, just giving people an equal card uh, he has a big impact on health. But this is the work. So if you ever really wanna dig into this, a guy named Raj Chetty, R-A-J-C-H-E-T-T-Y, has fantastic YouTubes on this, he's going to win the Nobel Prize in economics. I never thought as a doctor I needed to understand economics, but it's critically important as you do. Politics, economics, uh, and biology, all important. Uh, so this is now. Where you live dictates when you die. And this is true in Chicago, the Loop versus Garfield Park. It's true in the United States. So I'm gonna explain this. This is from Raj Chetty. So if you're in the top 5%, so the bottom of the graph, the x-axis is median income, the left axis is life expectancy at 40. So you've made it to 40, it eliminates infant mortality. Top 5%, doesn't matter where you live in the United States, what city you live in where, if you're in the top 5% of income, you're gonna live a long time no matter what. But look what's happened when you go down to median income. Below median income in the United States, life expectancy, which is around $55,000 for a family of four, life expectancy begins to diverge. And you can see at the bottom 5%, there is uh, an eight year life expectancy gap between the poor <clears throat> in New York City and the poor in Detroit. Of course, if you look at places like Birmingham and other places in the South, this gap uh, uh, is larger. So there's about a 15 year life expectancy gap overall between the, uh, the 
the rich and the poor, but where you're poor makes a difference. And this is where public policy, policy around health insurance, uh, minimum wage policies, access to education policies, they can make a difference. This is not just about the three Bs, beliefs, behaviors, and biology. It's about the structural conditions under which people live. Uh, and, you know, I call it uh, 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 structural racism is a killer uh, and is something we need to pay attention to uh, because, and so people say, well, isn't it just poverty? Uh, what does racism really have to do with it? Well, one is racism is a system that assigns value based on skin pigment. It's been around for at least 500 years, uh, uh, in, in 400 years in active slavery, but 500 years uh, since we began uh, the genocide of Native Americans. And this devaluation shows up uh, in life expectancy independent of income. So we need to name racism first, uh, and we need to, uh, uh, you know, think about it. Uh, how do we how do we mitigate this with through public policy? So this is now uh, the pandemic, uh, racial disparity. This is July thirtieth. It's a little bit old. Uh, the, look at the these are the death rates per hundred thousand people. Uh, and you can see white is 30 uh, and black or African-American is 74, uh, Native Americans and Latinos, uh, you know, higher as well. Uh, so there's a, a, a fact and just think about all, so the virus was called the great equalizer. Uh, everyone's success, susceptible by, this is, this, is, this is the way to think of social uh, causation versus biological causation. We would all agree and admit that uh, the corona, that we, we all had immunity. I mean, we, we none of us had immunity to the coronavirus. So from a biological perspective, we were all equally vulnerable. But from a social perspective, we were disproportionately uh, 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 vulnerable. And all what COVID did was plant its roots and seeds into the uh, pre-existing fault lines of a racialized society. Let me give you an example. I saw a patient in the clinic today and uh, uh, he was a husband of another one of my patients. And when COVID first hit rush, uh, if you people remember, everyone was talking about travel history. You travel to China, you travel to Europe. And uh, these were the first cases, and it was before we were declaring community spread. And I'm looking through the cases at my hospital. Literally, we had a, it was the second day we got, we started having cases. Maybe we had 30 patients in the hospital. And I scrolled down, and, and there is my patient, and she has COVID. And I read the history uh, that she's sick, her husband is sick. Her mother was sick and her kids were sick. By where do they live? That Garfield Park neighborhood, life expectancy under 69. What did she do for a living? She worked at O'Hare as a baggage handler. <coughs> Coming back every day on the L, we had maybe 20 cases in the hospital. I said, it's, it's being spread by community. She didn't travel, but she was in contact with travelers. And then because she didn't have sick days, because she had sickle cell anemia, and is in the hospital a lot, didn't have PTO, she went to work sick. And this is how COVID spread. And you could see it spread in her neighborhood because she was traveling in and out, uh, kind of an essential worker, a front-facing worker, uh, essential only during this moment in time. These were folks who were never essential. So when I presented this work uh, to our board in this life expectancy gap, we had taken on the mission, as I told you, to go from being the best in healthcare to improving health. And I told uh, my board and CEO the importance of naming root cause. I've done some new root cause naming already for you. When something goes wrong in the hospital to a patient, uh, let's say someone goes comes in for a knee replacement, but they get an infection from an IV and they get very sick or they die. We must do a root cause analysis. That means you go and you ask 
why five times? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why did this happen? And find the root cause. And it's important to find the root cause because if you don't name the root cause, you can't make anything better. Um, and so I told uh, the board and I've told our CEO and the leadership at my institution uh, <clears throat> that we needed to name the root cause of poor health outcomes in this country. And I'm, these, I'm sorry, in these neighborhoods. And we named for the first time in 180 years in a report at Rush that structural racism and economic deprivation were root causes of the life expectancy gap. And that we couldn't possibly continue on, we should continue on being as good as we are in clinical care and continue to be a terrific hospital. But we needed to take a step more and address the conditions that have perpetuated uh, structural racism. And the way that I described it to them is that we needed to put a racial equity lens on everything we did. And a, a racial equity lens simply asks the following question. How are the conditions we're seeing, the results we're getting, our policies and procedures, who's in leadership, who's in governance, continue to ask any question you want, how do these uh, facts perpetuate a historical injustice that have white on top and black and brown on the bottom? And, and if we're perpetuating, uh, or the rich on top and the poor on the bottom, or men on top and women on the bottom, we need to put a racial equity lens on everything we do, and particularly with regard to the community. And we needed to go out to the community and tell them, you know, guess what, uh, folks? Uh, we have a responsibility and accountability for what happened, because we were the, one of the first hospital, first medical school in Chicago, been around since the 1830s. So we've been there all of these years while these conditions were being created, and we didn't do enough. Now, I'm just going to pause here and tell you about the root cause analysis on myself, because while I've always been, you know, the same human being and went to Chicago to train at Cook County Hospital to really take care of poor people, it wasn't until a few years ago that I was be able to say, uh, speak about racism and white supremacism as forms of affliction and oppression. And I really had to ask myself, and this is probably, I've been comfortably talking about it probably for five or six years now. Uh, and I had to do a root cause analysis on myself and say, why did it take me so long? Even though I've worked in these communities, I've seen life through the eyes of my patient. I've always been kind and compassionate. Why did it take me so long to name racism? So. Remember, you ask why five times you'll figure out the root cause of the first why. Well, I didn't feel comfortable saying the words. Well, why didn't I? Well, people around me really didn't talk uh, about you know racism or these things. Well, why didn't they talk about racism? Well, they were largely uh, white people. Well, why didn't I want to say anything to them? And I come down to the conclusion, well, they invited me in the room, and why would I want to be disrespectful to them by raising something that would make them feel uncomfortable. And I realized then that even though my family background was one of oppression and uh, uh, you know, genocide uh, in Europe, in this country, I was assigned to privilege. I was assigned to advantage. And I've had an unearned advantage. And that unearned advantage allowed me I had to be smart enough, yes, and this, all this other stuff, but my unearned advantage made me comfortable to the other people and I could progress and the doors open and I got into the C-suite at an academic medical center. But I never, but that comfort level I had with being invited in made me uncomfortable to name racism. And so I just vowed that I would speak about it and I would talk about it uh, and that it was important to, because I was convinced that racism was the source of uh, the diabetes, the hypertension, the stress, and the premature mortality in my patients. So, uh, you know, when I started out medicine, I, I knew that health was a human right, uh, but it took me all these years to name racism. 
So we still have large racial gaps and maternal mortality. Uh, we once we added up in 2009 all the excess black deaths in Chicago that were uh, just because black people did not have the same uh, life experience as the white people. It was 3,200 uh, excess deaths. Uh, uh, that's a world trade tower every year in Chicago. By the way, that number we looked again in 2019 is the same. Uh, the life expectancy gap in Chicago between blacks and whites is almost nine years. And if you look nationally, since we first started counting white and black deaths in 1900, there have been 8.5 million excess black deaths that people who could have been alive with potential inventors, uh, doctors, Nobel Prize winners, dead. Uh, where you uh, mortality is neighborhood dependent, it's not race dependent. We've conflated race uh, uh, to be biological. Race is a social and political construct. It's not a biological construct. This is a patient we've navigated through breast cancer. If you look at our hospitals, the board members are largely white still, and they're li largely men, uh, and they're old. I want to talk about our strategy at Rush. Uh, and how we did this. And this is a strategy for all health systems. Like if you really want to take racial justice on, how do you do it? But it's got to be a strategy. It's got to be one of your top strategies to say that we're going to be an institution that's going to pursue racial justice. It's got to be endorsed by the trustees. Uh, our plans uh, call to accelerate diversity, inclusion, and leadership to achieve demographic parity, uh, screening our patients, and partner to treat the social and structural determinants of health, social needs, social determinants. If someone's hungry, if they don't have home, we've got to we've got to take those things on as providers. But at the same time, we've got to address the community conditions. Uh, we name the root cause of health inequity, including structural racism, economic and edu educational deprivation. How I'm talking to you, how I talk to my board, uh, no difference. We have identified opportunities to build wealth among our low-wage employees through pension reform, education, and career pathways. We named our, our, our employees the, our first community, uh, and we realized you could come to a place like ours, uh, work in the kitchen for your whole life, career, uh, go uh, retire and be poor. And we said, we have to create career pathways for people to wealth. Uh, we've adopted an anchor mission to buy or hire, invest, and volunteer locally. Uh, we, fo we focus on health outcomes gaps by looking at our data by race, ethnicity, language, age, gender. Uh, uh, we partner with community groups uh, and to address place-based root causes of, of these gaps, actually, and to acknowledge our responsibility and accountability for not being uh, more active prior to this. And then we communicate widely in many forums about what do we mean by equity and, what do, and racism. So I want to leave you in this part with this thought. Equity means those who need more should get more. Uh, we, we, have, we have these expressions we say in this country, a rising tide raises all boats. That's equality, right? If everyone's in a boat, the tide rises, you'll raise. But many people aren't in boats or their boats have holes in them. Those people need more. We have a health system that rewards those with more. Our insurance system, uh, uh, we have a wealth system uh, that uh, you know, wealthy people get access to better care than poor people in this country. We said if we took this on, it, it was gonna be good, but not enough. I told you there were 600,000 people in our immediate neighbor, neighborhood, 40% black, 40% Latinx, and 20% uh, white. And we said to ourselves, how do we do this in a more intentional way? And we gathered all the hospitals in the region uh, and we went out to the community and did listening tours and said, what do you want? Uh, what do you think? There's an expression about community engagement uh, that goes like this, nothing about us without us, uh, that we could not pretend to come in, uh, do anything in the community without the explicit permission, advice, and leadership uh, from the community. So we got all the hospitals together, we met with the community and he said, what if we could all come together, hospitals uh, and the community? What if we could focus on, you can see these four boxes here, uh, not just health and healthcare, which is our usual box, but the neighborhood environment, 
educational outcomes, economic vitality, things that are, we call the structural determinants of health. What if we could focus on these together? What if we could together reduce the life expectancy gap between the loop and the West side by 50% by 2030? What would we need to do? And here's what the community said. We want you, we want jobs. We want just any jobs. We want good paying jobs where we can accumulate wealth by our house, by houses. Uh, we love our communities. We want you to, we, we want the news about our communities to be positive. Two, support local businesses. Three, our children feel helpless. Help our children. And so we created this racial health equity collaborative, first in the first time ever in Chicago. Uh, power is being shared. So what do we mean by uh, um, equity? Equity means a number of things. So on the one hand, it means, um, uh, I said, those who need more uh, should get more. Another way to think about uh, equity is uh, the, <clears throat> that where you work, live, and play uh, determine your health. And if we can make the conditions where you work, live, and play better, we can improve your health. And another way that you can define equity is the sharing of power, resources, and money. So we knew when we created Westside United that we had to power share with the community. So there's a board with six hospital reps and six uh, community reps. And it's really on the side, you can see uh, uh, what the, uh, the goals are here. I'm not gonna read them out, uh, but you can see ra naming racism was a first uh, piece of this. Now you get one point in the world for naming things. It's not such a big deal ultimately to name something. You get a hundred points to fixing it. And the goal here uh, is to fix it. Actually last night, we just had our first career pathway group uh, 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 get uh, their graduations, 100% pass rates. We are creating pathways for people to generate wealth. So we're looking at the five main drivers uh, of life expectancy by focusing on four impact areas. I mentioned cardiometabolic disease and cancer, homicide, infant mortality, and the opioid overdose. These five diseases account for 70% of the pre premature mortality. But when we're focusing on the social determinants of health, and the two that are most important, driving health or education and economic vitality. Out of the realm, you would think of health and healthcare, but we tend to be the biggest employers in the neighborhood. We're putting a lot of capital in these neighborhoods. These are the hospitals that are in, and if you added up our size, we'd be the largest corporation in the state of Illinois. Now we're the first of this type in the country. There's groups of hospitals and other uh, educational institutions doing this around the country, but we are economic anchors of these neighborhoods uh, and our work can be uh, very deliberate. When COVID hit, I mentioned 70 out of the first 100 deaths we're in black people, a mayor of Chicago who was, uh, uh, Lori Lightfoot, who was elected unanimously on an anti-poverty, anti-racism platform was just devastated. She said it took, it took our breath away and she said it was outrageous. And she asked her, asked her staff, what can we do? And uh, the staff came up with some ideas and she said, that's not good enough, call Westside United. So on a Sunday night in early April, after this first data came out about black disproportionality and Lori was on, uh, Mayor Lightfoot was on uh, uh, the news across the country. We had a conversation with the mayor's office and we said, you need the community at the table with the providers, with the city. We need a SWAT team approach. And out of this, the next day, the mayor uh, announced a Chicago racial equity rapid response team, put this uh, West Side United co-chairing with the city uh, with community leaders from all the hardest hit communities and with all the providers and say, what can we do? And we've really flipped the paradigm. Number one, the community leader says we need resources in our community. Folks are hungry. And so here you talk about social determinants of health, hu hunger, food deserts. This is a food uh, drive uh, that was set up from the racial equity rapid response team. We took testing into the neighborhood the provider said, you know, you should only be tested if you're uh, symptomatic. Our community partners around the table said, no, anyone who demands a test should get a test. And that's how we set it up. We, rather than wait for the patients to come to us, we all, 
decided that we were going to call our patients. And so we called 75,000 families in about a four week period, called them up by race and ethnicity. We called up our black and brown patients in the highest hard hit neighborhood, putting a racial equity lens on those who need more, should get more to give them check on their healthcare, give them access to food and COVID education. Uh, this work is going on. This weekend, we're going to the hardest hit neighborhood in Chicago, and we're gonna do door-to-door -door education uh, in that neighborhood. Uh, it's really taking racial, racial equity uh, uh, at face value and at its heart. And this is really the one of the few responses like this uh, in the country. We did work in the homeless population. And as a result, we're in the, now the second, second wave, so I can only speak for the first wave. We got COVID under control in Chicago. Uh, not in every neighborhood, but overarchingly uh, uh, under control. But more than that, when George Floyd uh, died, we sat around the table and said, we've got to call out racism. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see from my uh, university, this was not without con controversy, that we put Black Lives Matter uh, on our billboards. But on the right-hand side, this is a public statement that 40 uh, hospitals and clinics in Chicago uh, put out on Juneteenth. It's undeniable racism is a public health crisis. And as members and leaders from many of Chicago's healthcare organizations addressing the disproportionate black and brown mortality from COVID-19, we say without hesitation, black lives matter. So I wanna pause here for a minute. Four weeks prior to this, zero hospitals likely in the United States would put out a statement like that. Why did we put out a statement like that? We were all around the COVID table with a racial equity frame. Uh, we knew we lived in a racialized society and that we had to change the narrative. This was a moment to make a pledge, not just it was a public uh, health crisis, but over on the right, we commit to in a series of commitments. Uh, and what we're doing now is we are developing a scorecard or a progress report on these commitments and we're gonna roll it out. It's gonna be the first healthcare system uh, racial equity scorecard uh, that's ever been developed in this country. 400 years after slavery, 401 years, we're finally gonna start measuring institutions on racial justice. And all of this came out of naming racism uh, as a root cause of death. Now I'm gonna end on this note uh, and hopefully um, be able to get into a dialogue with you. When I became a doctor, I wanted to do good for people. Uh, I was uh, quickly understood that uh, that wasn't enough. And when I tell audiences, when I tell young people, anyone, yes, I'm a doctor, I'm a hospital administrator, I'm a social epidemiologist, but if you ask me why I'm doing what I'm doing, is because that first year of medical school, during a moment of really a deep soul searching, I realized why I wanted to become a doctor. And that was because health was a human right. So I consider myself a human right activist. Uh, I'm led by human rights uh, and the need for human rights. It keeps me going every day. It's why I don't ever give up. It's why I give talks like this to hope I can, in an audience of as big as yours, or I can't even tell how many people are here, that one or two or three people will see that they can do this because this is not just about your practice, it's about leadership. This is uh, uh, on the left, the famous Bob Cousy, captain of the Celtic. He was a white guy of Irish descent. Uh, Bill Russell, the forward, uh, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, black guy, of course, I think he's from Louisiana. Uh, the Celtics won more championships uh, up until this moment than the Lakers. I think they are tied with the Lakers. Uh, and this is them uh, hugging after uh, winning the NBA uh, basketball tournament. But Bill Russell was not uh, uh, welcomed uh, into the NBA. Every city he went to, uh, he was, uh, uh, racial epithets were hurled at him. Uh, there were some places, some towns, he couldn't eat with the rest of the team. Uh, someone broke into his house and put human excrement on his bed, and he persevered through this. 
Uh, Bob Cousy was interviewed last year or the year before uh, in the New York Times reflecting on uh, his career. They're both in their 80s now. Uh, and he said the following, I wish I'd done more. And none of us here in this country, uh, divided as it is with the conflict we is going into healthcare, none of us want to be able to look back in a racialized society that has valued people based on skin color. And this is for the white people in the room. Um, it's up to you to speak. It's not up for black people and brown people to speak. It's up for white people to speak. When I thought about my family being let off uh, under uh, by the Nazis, it wasn't up for the Jews in Europe to speak. It was up for the other citizens to speak on their behalf. It's up for white people and white leaders, those of you who want to be allies, to speak up against racism, other forms of exclusion, uh, and other forms of human rights uh, abuses. We have to talk about racism as a public health crisis, as an affliction, as a cause of premature death, and we have to vow to do everything that we can uh, to eliminate it. <clears throat> when, uh, when we were conceptualizing West Side United, we, we've, uh, all of our community members are paid, by the way, a group of community members uh, were around a table, asked to visualize what the future might look like if we achieved the goal uh, of uh, eliminating the death gap between the loop and the west side of Chicago. So you can see the headline, Health Equity Achieved. It's a little bit of a complicated uh, drawing here. You can see a bridge uh, being built uh, going off into the future. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, the storm clouds of systematic uh, systemic racism, disinvestment, short-term focus. You can see the person with the umbrella on the left side. You can see all the neighborhoods together, working together. Uh, you can see our four uh, cornerstones of West Side United, economic vitality, educational attainment, neighborhood environment, and health and healthcare. You can see the pillars, long-term investment, equal opportunity, sustainment, advocacy, public policy, uh, all the things we've talked about. And down at the bottom, building these pillars of the schools, the community organizations, the community members, health care organizations, and then the headlines, uh, the unemployment rates at an all-time low. West Side schools earn record recognition. On the far right, life expectancy of the West Side rises to match the loop. These were the headlines that the community members came up with. And the one we love the best, changing the West Side story from violence to victory. When, we, when I sit around this racial equity rapid response table, when I sit around the West Side United table, when I see these incumbent workers, people who work in the kitchen or the guest relations, uh, graduate last night in a workforce development ceremony, 100% pass rate, all of them creating wealth for their family. I know that we can do more, uh, and we can, uh, but we can do more uh, together. And uh, in the end, I never thought I'd be doing this work uh, uh, of uh, in, in not just being a doctor, but this is the critical work of our times. So I'm gonna end there and uh, take questions. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. We have uh, questions being submitted in the Q&A and we will read off the questions and allow you to have a conversation with our audience. So the first question is, how did you convince the leadership team to invest in addressing uh, the structural determinants of health? Given that so many uh, people acknowledge these issues exist, some folks will admit they exist, but so few people are willing to actually address the uh, structural determinants of health independent of policies. So, um, well, it's an interesting story, you know. Uh, so, you know, um, as a white person, uh, I never noticed white spaces. I don't know if you've ever heard that uh, description. Uh, but I, as a white person, I never knew that the spaces I was operating in were white spaces meaning they were designed uh, for the comfort of white people. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of my insights actually I got by going 
from two poor hospitals on one street to a wealthy hospital just down the street and just being personally so shocked by, because I, I had this idea that if people like me just showed up at the, the federally qualified health centers and you know the safety net hospitals, the LA counties of the world, that that would be enough. And I said, oh, it's rigged. I sound like Trump, Ralph. It's rigged, but it is rigged. It's rigged. And I was angry, but I didn't, I realized, you know, I was hired as the chief medical officer at Rush. I was in charge of quality and safety. And so here's how I did it. There's always, this is why leadership skills for this work is critically important to think about yourselves, those of you that you have your job, you have to be a terrific doctor. I, I spent a lot of time, I'm a really good doctor, I'm not bragging. I must be a really good doctor in order to be able to lead the social, uh, social medicine things ahead. Because if you're not good at your profession, then you, 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 people uh, dismiss you. But I knew that I had to sort of tell, be able to tell a narrative uh, to our leaders. So this is obviously, I've been at Rush for 15 years and this didn't happen until 10 years in. And you can imagine that I'm not changed. I'm not a changed human being. I didn't have a conversion 10 years in. But what we did was this. I was always getting involved with things. I have, a, I have a role in life is step into these types of things. And I would bring these things to the leadership. So we found, uh, and, and through those uh, examples, the leadership would get some insight. So we, we, we got involved with something looking at, it's in the book on breast cancer, black, white mortality for breast cancer that everyone said was biological. We basically said it was a quality issue. And then we could demonstrate through getting everyone to improve their quality that we could reduce the black white mortality gap. Did we end structural racism? No. Did we reduce the gap? Yes. How do we do it? Quality improvement. My CEO came to the kickoff of when we started it. And then 10 years later, seven, eight years later, we, we showed the data, wrote the paper that showed that Chicago was the only city in the country that reduced a mortality, a black mortality. Uh, and no other city in the country did it. Well, for him, that was eye-opening for him. And when we went to change to improve health, I had that root cause discussion that I had with you, with him. He understood root cause analysis from a hospital. Then I said things to him like this. When, when we were trying to, in the hospital, I was trying, so what I did was managing up by trying to get him to see by using examples that he understood. So when, when I was chief medical officer, I got up in front of Rush and said, we're going to eliminate, eliminate harm events, bad things that happen to people in the hospital while they're coming in to get something else by 50% in three years. And uh, he looked over to me and said, how can you say that? I said, to say anything less would be unjust. There's an urgency not to harm patients. We didn't, it took us a little more than three years, but we did it. When I said, we need to look at this life expectancy gap and reduce it by 50% by 2030, he understood from that other example, the urgency of it. I try to explain racism and other forms of oppression and exclusion in a way so people can understand it is an act of violence. And I think over time, not only our senior leadership, but our board has adopted the language. Death gaps, when I started saying death gaps, which is quite stark, I, my CEO said, well, can you call them life expectancy gaps? I said, no, they're death gaps. You know, it's, so a lot of this is, is you've got to be able to have courageous conversations and you've got to be able to get in. So, now, why, why could I do this? I, my, my unearned advantage of being a white male and having been a senior leader, I'm chief medical, I'm chair of a department, I've done all these sort of things. So I had an uh, advantage, but how dare me not speak to this when I knew in my heart it was true. And so I, if I have trouble explaining something, so this is the other thing for all of you who are trying to make change. 
I have an expression, I've gotten this from someone else. When, some, when I'm having a conversation and it's, I'm not getting what I want, I always say to myself, look in the mirror first. What more can I do in this moment to get the results uh, that I actually want? And then I do something like leverage separate realities and take advantage. We all come to the same situation with a separate viewpoint. Uh, and at that point, when I get stuck, I ask questions. I come from curiosity. It turns out that description I gave of Garfield Park, that it was uh, 1950s, that was my C how my CEO processed it. And what I did was find ways in which he processed information, and I would start to use it. I used to say the gap was bigger than the gap between the United States and Haiti. He asked the question, when in the last time was life expectancy in the United States? And I would then use lines that he would say as a reinforcing, and that's called managing up. So I managed over time. Here's the other thing. Your CEOs, the leaders of organization, once they get to be there, they wanna leave a mark and a legacy. This, by the way, was his legacy. He retired last year and uh, this was his legacy. And it's been uh, personally, really rewarding for him. Uh, but he didn't start there and it just took time. But we have to have these conversations with each other. I hope that helped. That did, thank you so much for your insight and in how to uh, really communicate with people and positions of change and to also be change, uh, be the change as well. So yeah. we have other questions uh, that are here. Uh, one was, how did you frame your proposal to obtain the amount of COVID-19 testing kits for people of color when other clinicians were opposed to it? Gosh, I got to tell you something. When we set up, so I want to go back to the organizer of this. If you believe so I use, I've learned to use these words carefully in a sense. So every word I'm using, I use to desensitize the use of the word, but then therefore increase the meaning of the word. So if you look at uh, racism uh, uh, and uh, uh, t I call it toxic capitalism, the way we devalued human life in this country by the lack of regulation of a capitalist economic system, which concentrates capital in the hands of few at the expense of many. You wondered, what does that have to do with tests? But I'm gonna to get to it. So we have, if you acknowledge that this is in a form of oppression and now you're sitting around the table with the city leaders, imagine this, with the chief equity officer of the city of Chicago, first time ever, with the deputy mayor, with the providers and community leaders, and you all agree that we live in a racialized society in which some people have more and other people have less. How you begin to frame your solutions is through an equity lens, focus on those who need more. And so when we started looking at disproportionately in these neighborhoods, how are we going to do it? I, I will tell you, uh, uh, just things that, that happened as a result of this framing. So all an equity frame says is how do we not repeat historic injustices? There's not always an evil perpetrator. There's not always a Trump, right? There's not always someone out there who's always evil. No, these are beautiful, nice people systems that are perpetrating them. We're all cogs in the system. How do we not replicate it? So we said, we must disproportionately get testing and free testing into the neighborhoods. It was a big, it was a big discussion. And did we have enough? And I got to tell you, we don't have enough, but we've done better and more. We've, we now have these neighborhoods with uh, mostly Latinx neighborhoods with higher rates. There's about 10 higher neighborhoods and we're focusing on them hyper acutely. I mentioned that before. Testing has gone up 30% in those neighborhoods. We are around the table uh, with this group, the racial equity rapid response, three times a week, uh, thinking through how do we solve these problems? 
Do we solve them perfectly? No. But are we, do we have an equity lens on it? A hundred percent. And I will say, this has never happened before in Chicago. I'd like to quote Martin Luther King here. He said, it's reasonable, 1960s, it's reasonable to say that if we can change it in Chicago, the second largest city in the city, now it's LA, we can change it anywhere in America. And we're, that's what we're around the table. We're not minimizing how difficult this is and how devastating this is, but we are around a table using a racial justice lens to solve problems. Thank you so much, Dr. Enzel. Um, there are a number of questions and I'm gonna, we'll try and get to most of them. Um, another uh, person is asking, can you speak a little bit more about the development and psychometrics and the distribution of the equity, racial equity card that you've mentioned? Uh, I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, so I, I guess um, you talked about sort of a, a, a strategy. Um, oh, the scorecard. Of the scorecard. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is interesting. Listen, we're in it's 400 years, 500 years, if you want to say how many years this has been going on, deeply embedded into every system that we're in. Here you have, an, you know, perhaps an enlightened white man who spent so many years uh, working with black and brown patients, but took me, me so long to name racism, just shows you how we got a long way to go and we're in the midst of a pandemic. But it's really important to start by measurement. I said narrative plus data plus action equals change. Uh, narrative is we got to, we've got to acknowledge that Amer uh, healthcare in America was built on a foundation of white supremacism uh, and uh, structural racism and those systems set in motion are still in motion today by everything we do, including the way that we insure people uh, in this country. Uh, the largely, uh, you know, there are more white people in the United States on Medicaid than black people, but in many places it's people of color who are more likely to be uninsured and such. So it's a very heavily layered system. Uh, on the, so the idea that we can improve it quickly uh, 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 is we have to be, sanguine about that idea, but we absolutely can improve, cannot improve it if we don't measure it. So the narrative, I just gave you the narrative, the data of the scorecard. So what we've done is it came out of the mayor's racial equity rapid response team. We have some great consulting help on putting this together. We've taken it around the country to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, to the hospital associations, uh, to uh, the nation's essential hospitals, uh, and hopefully we're gonna pilot test it uh, really right after Thanksgiving in Chicago. And we're gonna to try to get a group of uh, pilot testing, uh, hospitals around the country and clinics to pilot test it. And we've got to figure out how to score it. It can't be, no one should be getting an A on this, by the way, okay? Uh, in fact, no one should be getting a B from what I can tell. So it, sh it should be C, D, or F. So we have to work out those pieces of it but it's moving along. We're trying to keep it uh, like 30 questions or so. It's hard to do that. Uh, but the idea that we're going to actually try to measure this, actually shout out to those medical students, White Coats for Black Lives formed uh, uh, after uh, the tragedy in Ferguson, uh, revitalized uh, uh, this year. Uh, and the students have made demands on our organization. Actually, we're filling out their scorecard. It's even harder uh, scorecard because they get right down to really specific kinds of things too as well. But the idea is to get something that becomes the national model for measuring this. Uh, but it's gonna have to go through a process of scrutiny and by lots of different groups and organizations to make sure we have it right. Great. Um, let's see, I think uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, says, I'm imagining that the stance on racial equity in the hospital system, um, setting, setting the needs to have a united front um, um, among all staff was, was challenging. 
I also imagine that there was some pushback. How did you and the rest of the leadership address this? Well, don't think we've won anything yet, okay? So let's just be clear. I gotta tell you, it was, I wanna say sort of the inside story. So when um, uh, George Floyd was murdered on the 25th, and that was a Monday, and it percolated on the news. If you remember, it was at Central Park, the bird watcher, and uh, the woman calling the police on him. It was all those things happened at once. And then it percolated around and it hit everybody emotionally in our place, probably the Wednesday. Now, mind you, this is not the first one. We had Laquan, we, we, we go back, uh, Charleston, Laquan McDonald. We found ourselves in the absence of national leadership, or even the mayoral leadership in Chicago, uh, and the governor of Illinois, the last one, we felt we needed to communicate to our employees after every one of these tragic events that happened. We were saying we could not allow something go on nationally without commenting on it. I tell you this is because the frame of the organization was sensitized and we had taken on this mission around community health equity in which we named racism, but we never named it internally. So when George Floyd was murdered, uh, uh, you know, and thank goodness for students. The students uh, were demanding that we do things and we were saying, we got to make a statement. Uh, in the meantime, COVID, we were COVID and there was all this stuff going on. And, you know, you can imagine uh, people being t heads turned around. We, there was a discussion we have on our, on our windows of rush, wash your hands. It was put out in the COVID thing and people wanted to pull down the wash your hands and put up Black Lives Matter. And we, I was sat quietly in the room at one board meeting where we had some board members who basically said, if you put that on your building, we're not gonna give you any money. And other board members uh, who really pushed back. And uh, I, uh, so it was, it was a big deal. We actually put it on our billboards and put Black Lives Matter, period. So we didn't put hashtag. And uh, we wanted to just make it as a statement of fact. And then there was another board meeting and we went to the CEO and said, this is me and <clears throat> my uh, deputy who's a black woman and the head of government relations who's a black man. And we were trying to, we're organize, helping organize the, 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 thought, the thought process around this said, let us come to the board meeting. And we staged a presentation and I got up first, old white guy, former CMO, someone they knew, led them through their quality thing. And I went through the, I went through the timeline of our history. I said, when I got into Russia in 20, 2005, I asked Larry Goodman, our CEO, what was important? He said, we need to be the best in quality. And we uh, got to be the best in quality. We really worked on quality. And then we took on safety. I talked to you about that, no harm. We took on safety and we reduced harm events. Along the way, we said diversity and inclusion was important to us and we put energy into this. Now, racial justice. Now we're here's where we are. This is the next step in our journey, becoming an anti-racist institution. And then Terry Peterson got up and said, um, um, I wanna tell you, Black, why Black Lives Matter means what it means. Uh, one is a statement of fact. Two, our patients are black, our staff are black. I wanna tell you what it's like when I go to the South side of Chicago to my mother's house and uh, the police stop me and what that's like. You know, he personalized it. And then uh, Darlene, my, the vice president I work with got up and said the quote uh, from Martin Luther King. She said, you know, Martin Luther King has a lot of quotes but the, uh, one of them that people don't know about is the riot uh, is the you know, expression from the of the voiceless. And so she announced that we at Rush were going to form a racial justice action committee to take on institutional racism. So what we did was frame it. We used that narrative. See, what we did is <laughs> we used the narrative again in a way to get the board, which you know, most boards are not ready for this stuff. Uh, but we, what we did is provide some nice cover for our CEO, but also to do this public 
uh, a form of public theater in which we stated that we must do this. And we have a racial justice action committee with a series of recommendations. Honestly, our, our employees, especially our black and brown employees, they're, you know, they like what we're doing, but they want, they want higher wages. You know, they want, they want more opportunity. Uh, you know, we actually included on our employee engagement statements uh, uh, issues of, of racial and ethnic exclusion for the first time. So we're gonna measure stuff we've never measured before. And the narrative from the employees, you know, it's, it's gonna be painful. We're gonna go, so there's three words I, I like to use, uh, 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 reconciliation, restoration, and reparation. And I like to use them not to uh, be controversial of any, I don't think they're controversial, but I to use the, the um, verbs of them, the action. We have to reconcile with our history and our past. We have to repair, not only the from the damage done, uh, but we have to repair moving forward. We need to restore us, you know, sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense of, you know, so these are the, these, these are like core values, right? This is our work. Health and healthcare of all the fields in the world is formed on a, on a foundation of social justice. And so all we're doing is going back to our basic principles, but you can see in the process of even telling you all this, how I've taken the uh, so I've taken out of these words the and made them make, they're very aspirational. We're going to have to walk through. We're going to, have to go to the. We're going to, have to be in the desert for a long time because the amount of damage that we've done systematically uh, is deep and it's deep within all our institutions. But we're we're going to take that walk, uh, and and we're going to do it and we're going to do it together. Uh, and so that's how it happened. What, what I laid out to you is exactly what happened. So it's not as rosy and, you know, as it may sound, uh, but it's a, it's a journey and we're on it. And for a white institution, it's a pretty big deal. Thank you, Dr. Ansel, for walking us through the history of um, making change at Rush and, uh, and actually giving us a uh, a template or a prototype to make changes where we are and, and ways to talk to uh, institutions to make change. I think it's always difficult to find out or to figure out where to start, uh, but you've given us quite a lot to, to work with. We have one last question uh, from Dr. Susan Rogers, someone I think you're- Oh, my favorite Dr. Susan Rogers, <laughs> my hero, Dr. Susan Rogers, and my dear- She friend. asks, she says, Excellent talk, by the way. Um, where do you think the city of Chicago will be in two to three years in terms of health statistics? And how would you get the city to buy into investing in poor communities versus continuing to invest in wealthier communities to help improve these inequities? I think we're going to be, uh, you know, COVID, uh, the COVID death rates, the, the number of deaths we've had in the city, it's going to be, it, it, gosh, it could be the the second or third highest cause of death in the city. I showed you the five deaths, and I think it's going to be this uh, for a couple of years. Uh, and you know, the known deaths versus the uh, excess deaths from COVID. We haven't. We're doing a trying to calculate the excess deaths. You know, people were sent home. People never went into the hospital. People's deaths were misclassified. I think it's going to be devastating for the city. The economic devastation. I think there's right now. A numbers that could be wrong, 200,000, 300,000 people in a city of 3 million uh, uh, who are now out of work. In the Latinx community, people worked in, in you know, uh, underground economy, uh, no benefits, uh, nothing. People are literally starving. So I think we're going to see really, uh, really very bad uh, outcomes. These racial di divi racialized divisions that we have are not going to go away. First of all, my opinions and what I think is, you know, uh, the one percent uh, 
Uh, there are other people, I mean, there are people who feel the same way, but there are a lot of people who feel uh, differently. And a lot of people with a lot of money feel very differently about this. So it's going to be a battle. The mayor has committed uh, in Invest Southwest to invest in these, de these I don't call them disinvested, decapitalized neighborhoods. Uh, but the amount of capital investment, I we did a back of the envelope uh, uh, estimation of what kind of capital investment needs to be put in these 10 communities on the west side of Chicago. To, so they have that, the flywheel effect of economic uh, uh, activity. See, if people are poor and they don't have money in their pocket, they can't spend money at the store. We you need an economic engine that makes communities healthy. But we estimate that's about 70 to $100 billion. That's a lot of money, but you think about the war in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, it's $5 trillion. I think the mayor's got a tough, first of all, the budget in Chicago is hit hard. Uh, we didn't pay a, pay a fair tax uh, a law in Illinois. Uh, the second stimulus hasn't come through. Uh, so Susan, I, I don't know how we manage through this. And besides hospitals, we've got to get some of the big Chicago businesses to commit to not just you know uh, small investment, but really uh, investing large time in the neighborhoods. I think in this country, the government can help and certainly has to be at the table, but it's gonna we, we're gonna need private investments. I just think we're going into we're gonna go into a bit of a recession for sure. We're in one already, and, uh, so I think it's gonna be t more than a few years uh, to climb out of it. Um, but it's the time we do have to double down on these sort of neighborhood capital uh, investments. And it's gonna to have to be the, the public sector as well as the, the private sector. I just don't think the public sector has enough money now without the private sector coming in and doing investment as well. And Susan, thank you for listening in. She gives the best talks, by the way. way We're happy to have had both of you during this series. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ansel. This was a great way to wrap up our six part series, giving us uh, some perspective uh, on the history of the uh, mortality gaps in our country and the determinants that uh, are at the root causes of these uh, gaps and continue to um, uh, feed the gaps in mortality uh, through COVID-19 and uh, other um, chronic diseases through our country. So we, we are grateful to have you today and um, look forward to your next book and, uh, and, and perhaps having you back. Well, thank you for having me and, and thank you all uh, who came today. So thanks, be safe over Thanksgiving, wear a mask, socially distance and uh, spread love and kindness. All right, thank you and good night. Good night.